There are a million pulpits, I suppose, all over the world, and that's the calling that we have as ministers to magnify our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so to refer to this passage of scripture that I read to you, uh, that was read to you, um, Hebrews chapter 1, and going on to the uh, fourth verse of chapter 3, but it's the question, the familiar words of verse 3 of that second chapter that you all know, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And this salvation is so great because Jesus Christ is so great. Now there is um, absolute greatness and there is relative greatness. Um, We have a a mountain in Wales, Mount Snowdon, the highest mountain in England and Wales. It's just 4,000 feet high. You put it in the uh, Alps along Mont Blanc or the Matterhorn and it's it's a hill. (laughs) You put it in uh, the Himalayas, it's, it's a molehill. <laughs> it's relatively great. But, um, well, Mount Everest is, is absolutely great, isn't it? Jesus Christ has that kind of greatness. We have a mayor in Aberystwyth, and uh, he's not very well known even in Aberystwyth, uh, <laughs> let alone comparing him to the mayor of London or the mayor of, of New York, who are national figures, that's a relative greatness. And I make comparisons like that because that is the way that um, the writer to the Hebrews is uh, seeking to magnify Jesus Christ. They're losing heart, they're having a terrible time, they've been divorced by their husbands, they've been thrown out by their parents when they acknowledge that Jesus Christ was great as a saviour, as the Messiah, as the Son of God. And uh, he writes to them, and he, he wants to show that Jesus Christ isn't just relatively great compared to their high priests and uh, the prophets in the past, but that he is absolutely great. And he does a series of comparisons to display this in the um, first chapter here. The first uh, comparison he makes is with the prophets in the opening words. God, who at different times in different ways spoke to our fathers in times past by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by, by his son. The prophets then, well, they are the servants of God. They're sent, uh, born along by the Spirit of God to bring the word of God to men and women, God, they serve God in, in that way. They are relatively very, very great men, um, but not in comparison to the Son of God. Um, tomorrow morning, half past nine, the doorbell goes, you go to the door, and uh, it's a company delivering a, a book you've ordered. And then a quarter of an hour later, the doorbell goes again, and uh, it's a postman with some something for you and then 10 o'clock the doorbell goes again and you say well I'm popular this morning and uh, you go to the door and it's your son surprise mum he says surprise the firm sent me down and I knew you'd be in on a Monday morning it's wash day always for you on a Monday isn't it and uh, I knew I, I thought I'd give her a surprise and oh you were thrilled to see him and you give him a hug and a kiss and you bring him in and you say, coffee, tea, what you want, how's the wife, how are the children? And you sit with him and he's not just a, a postman or a delivery boy, he's your son. And you love him dearly and that's the comparison we have here of the uh, prophets compared to the son of God. Who's the greatest prophet? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, Who's the greatest baseball player? Who's the greatest singer? And we all have opinions and we all have different tastes. Um, Who's the greatest prophet? And you say, well, Elijah is the greatest prophet because when God brought a representative of the law to the Mount of Transfiguration, he brought... uh, Moses, and when he brought a representative of the prophets, he brought Elijah. 
because Elijah had known this uh, great victory on uh, Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal with their sordid religion which was destroying truth and redemption in the land. Um, They couldn't summon fire to fall from heaven upon the sacrifice. But when uh, one man compared to the 850, when one man prayed, when Elijah prayed, the fire fell and consumed even the water around the, the altar. That was the greatness of Elijah. And you'll remember then how Jezebel so annoyed that her prophets had been killed. She said, I'll get you for this. And Elijah fled, you remember, down several days out of the country until he collapsed in weariness under a a broom tree, a juniper tree, and said, Lord, take away my life. I'm no better than my father's. And you remember then how God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you? My servant, empowered by the God who answers prayer and sends fire. What, what, what are you doing here? Why aren't you finishing the work that I gave you to begin? The Lord Jesus, he never, uh, he never turned his back, even though it wasn't a woman, but it was Herod and Pontius Pilate and the chief priests, Annas, Caiaphas. It was... Uh, the Sanhedrin all opposed to him the mob he turned his face to Jerusalem he he didn't run away Jesus greater than Elijah or you'd say well I think the greatest prophet was Isaiah because you read there in in that prophecy of his of his beginnings a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they'll call his name Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Or oh, when he speaks of his death, all we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was bruised for our transgressions. He was wounded for our sins. By his stripes we are made whole. But when this great prophet, oh, he was a mighty prophet. When he saw the Lord, he saw him high, lifted up, his train filling the temple. He was overwhelmed and he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Woe is me, he says. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king. He felt he was so unclean. Jesus, when he spoke to his father, never, never said, I'm unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips. I always say the things you give me to say, says Jesus. So, greater, greater than Isaiah was the Lord Jesus Christ. Or if you ask Jesus, who's the greatest of the prophets? But he would tell you. He would give you a surprising answer. He would say... um, Of all born of women, none can compare to John the Baptist. What a great man he is. He'll not allow a a leaf of Indian paper to come between himself and and John. In his uh, testimony to what's true, he stands shoulder to shoulder with him. He agrees with him. And yet John the Baptist, when he looked at uh, at Jesus, the prophet John said, uh, I must decrease and he must increase. I'm not worthy to untie the latchet of his sandals. I shouldn't be baptizing him. That's just water. He baptizes our hearts. He changes our inward disposition and makes us new men and women. Uh, This is what he does. John says, oh, he's far greater than me. So here is Jesus Christ, and you can say which of those prophets you think is the greatest, but they're just servants of God. He is the Son of God. Or the second comparison he makes here is with um, the angels. And you will have been surprised if you were following the reading we heard 
uh, of the uh, stress that the writer to the Hebrews gives to angels. It was a part of Old Testament religion. Uh, They're there in the Garden of Eden protecting the way to the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're there on um, Mount Sinai with the giving of the Lord. They're there visiting the patriarchs and with Daniel, the prophets, the angels. They're just great figures. You remember when John on the Isle of Patmos actually sees an angel, how he collapses. His strength goes from him and he falls to worship this angel. And the angel says, oh, don't worship me. You worship only God. One angel could destroy the whole of the Assyrian army. So mighty in power and and glory. But uh, who are they? Well, they, they are simply then designed by Jesus Christ. He considered them. He thought of them. Um, he could see their usefulness. And so he made them. He is the Lord of the angels. And... Um, They received their orders from him day by day. They gathered before him this morning in heaven and he told them what they were to do. He said there's a preacher from Wales and he's going to be preaching in Cape Cod this morning. and Take him safely and bring a congregation, bring you all here safely. And they're lining the walls here at the present time. We can't see them but they're here with us as Jesus is also with us. Walking the aisles, touching you, speaking to you, helping you to understand and believe all I'm saying. As all I say is to be judged by the truth of the, of the scriptures. Jesus is the Lord of the angels. He never said to an angel, this writer to the Hebrews says, he never said, sit on my right hand until I make an enemy's thy footstool. He never said that to an angel. He never said it to Gabriel or to Michael. He only said it to his son, Jesus Christ. The angels then do the will. Um, They gather before him. He says to one angel, clean out the sewers. And he goes and does it. He says to another, be the emperor of uh, the greatest empire in the world. And the angel does it. It's immaterial to them. What God requires of them, once they know that this is the word of God, they they do it. Because he is their Lord and they are his servants, they are his subjects. We live in days when men are losing historic Christianity and lots of strange religions are taking their place. My friend in a little town called Narbeth in South Wales, that friend, uh, he knows of a group of women in that town that meet together and worship angels. And he bumped into one of them uh, last year and uh, said, uh, how are you today? Oh, I'm I'm well, Mr. Reese. Yes, I'm well. And how are you? And I'm, yes, I'm well. He said, oh, we're having wonderful times, you know, in our meetings, are you? Yes. Do you know how you can tell if an angel has been to one of your meetings? No, I don't know. What am I telling you about angels? You know, you know all of No, I don't know all about them. Well, you can tell if an angel has been to one of your meetings because they always leave a white feather behind. You might have heard that in other contexts. I could just see the deceit of it all, you know. She says at the end of her little meeting, now ladies, let's close our eyes. And they all close their eyes and she slips on. She puts a white feather down there. He saw her just this year and said, to her, well, how are you now? And then, oh, oh we, we do, we're not holding meetings any longer. The angels let us down. <coughs> and all false religion in the end, it will let you down. Only Jesus Christ won't let you down, ever. But if you're worshipping men or angels, 
in the end you're going to be heartbroken and disappointed. You'll never be disappointed when you worship Jesus Christ. So Christ is greater than prophets and he's greater than angels. And thirdly, in this passage, we're told that he's greater than the world's. Because it says in the second verse here in Hebrews 1, by whom also God made the worlds. Now, we normally have a a useful, simple uh, delineation of the work of the three persons in the Godhead. The Father, we say, is the great creator. Jesus Christ is the great redeemer. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives life and regenerates us and that's a a very useful and helpful introduction to the bible's trinitarian teaching but um it's it's too simplistic and too rigid because um we're also told that jesus christ had his role in creation aren't we you all know the opening of john's gospel In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And here it is again in the opening verses of uh, Hebrews 1. By him God made the worlds. He had this creatorial uh, work uh, uh, in the beginning. He and the Father together, they made the heavens and and the earth. I've just been filled with admiration as uh, I've driven around the Cape here and seen the trees. Yeah, at this fall time, and as we went through Rhode Island and then went to uh, the conference on Friday and Saturday, and the, the, the trees seemed to get even more glorious. The reds and the yellows and the greens there. What a, oh, I'll never forget the sights I've seen, the beauty of it. And uh, knowing the one who designed these, and made them doesn't make them any less glorious or wonderful to me my my savior made them all things bright and beautiful all creatures great and small all things wise and wonderful the lord god my savior made them all you know how our children they go to the big school when they're 11 they go up from junior high to senior high or that that sort of thing and they come back from their first day at school and they've emptied their lunch boxes and they brought back textbooks and they pick up the these look mum they say look chemistry look mum mathematics look mum geography And uh, they are daunted by these heavy volumes that they are given now that they will be studying. And we encourage them not to be distressed. And we say to them, well, these books are describing for us the thought patterns of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. How we, in 2019 believe and have worked out how he made the atom and how he sustains it and the galaxies and the laws of physics and mathematics uh, this is how he designed it we we haven't got it perfect yet and in a hundred years time we'll 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 change and we'll modify and we'll understand better but that's all you you're going to be studying what And how our Lord Jesus made the world. And how he made you. And how he made you fearfully and wonderfully. When a a potter 
gets the clay and starts to make it. He makes it. It doesn't make itself. He decides what honorable ornaments, vessels he's to shape and mold as the wheel turns round, and which he will put in his oven to cook. He's much wiser and more powerful than merely clay. Our God made the heavens and the earth. He made you. He designed you. He caused you to give your first breath. And the millions of times you breathe, if you're an old person, he, our breath is in his hands. We live, we move, we have our being in, in God. We're not a, a force of accident. It is not in the beginning was nothing. And then there was something. Nothing creates nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the explanation for the beauty and the harmony and the design that there is all around us and everything we see. But Christ is greater than the cosmos in its unimaginable vastness. The galaxies, as many as the grains of sand on the beaches, just incalculably great and glorious. Our God is great as the creator. The fourth comparison that he makes in this passage before us, he compares Jesus Christ to God. He doesn't say he's greater now, he doesn't say that at all, that he's greater than God, but he goes for the highest, the greatest. He goes for the infinite and he says, uh, Jesus Christ is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. That's what he says in the third and fourth verses of Hebrews 1, doesn't he? He compares him to God. And he is saying to us, it's not that Jesus is a little flickering candle here that you like to decorate your table but that uh, God is like the, the sun shining in its brightness and in its glory. You can't look at it without damaging your retina. He doesn't say that. He says, Christ is the brightness, the very brightness of God's glory. If you want to see it, if you want to understand what God is like, who is God, come with me to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and the writings of Paul and Peter and Jude and James and this epistle for us to show you how great Jesus Christ is. He's the brightness. If you want to see the wonder of God's mercy and the humility that God displays in that he comes to a meeting like this and blesses and helps us and receives the confession of our sins and says, you're forgiven because you've come in Jesus' name to me. <clears throat> then you look at Jesus Christ. You see him take a, a bowl of water and a towel and faces the 12 embarrassed, silenced disciples and one by one kneels before them and washes their feet and gets the donkey dung off their feet and dries between their toes and goes 24 feet, 40 minutes maybe, to wash their feet. The humility, the condescension, the pity of, of God for us in our silly pride and in our turning a blind eye deliberately when there are tasks and duties to be done. Or on the cross um, when Jesus was nailed there and then said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
there was no more godlike thing that Jesus ever did than to hang on that cross and pray that prayer for those who were crucifying him. If you want to see the grace and the pity and the love of God, then come with me to these Gospels and look with me at Jesus Christ in, in the grandeur of his person, the glory of his person. Jesus Christ, the brightness of God's glory, the express image, he says, the, uh, that is the transcript. Um, you remember how you longed in your office for a, a new photocopier to be delivered. The other one was jamming and there were shadows and it was just hopeless. And then one day two engineers came with a trolley and they, they brought in a a photocopier and then they began to unscrew it all inside and uh, then they plugged it in and then they picked up a, a piece of paper with a, a very fancy design and they put it down and they closed it and, put, and boom, within seconds out came and then they said now which is the original uh, and which is the copy because, oh, you, you, could, you couldn't tell. No, you could tell. I know if you've got a ma magnifying glass and you looked, you could tell the difference between the copy eventually and the original. You can't tell the difference between Jesus Christ as God and the Father as God. There they are. He is the express image. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The proof for the existence of God is Jesus Christ. He uh, displays to us the, the glories of God. There was great debate, you know, in the early church about who is this one how 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 can we understand him what does it mean in john 1 1 that he was with god and he was god with god and what is this withness that's with god and god had saved some of the greatest minds in all the world at that time Men like Augustine and Athanasius, the most thoughtful and alert and enlightened minds. And over um, a couple of hundred years, they formulated a wonderful definitions of who God is. And his, the relationship of the father and the son, and they had a phrase to describe the son. They said he was homo usios. Homo means the same, you know that, and usios is the same being that there are not three clouds in heaven three beings there's only one being here O Israel the Lord our God is is one Lord there's only one God the Father is God the Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God and these three are one God a God is a different kind of being from anything you have any acquaintance with or knowledge of in this world he is, he is different he is God <laughs> he had no beginning he will have no end he is infinite he is omniscient he is omnipresent he is without beginning and without end and that's true of father and son and, and holy spirit he, Jesus has all the names of God. He has all the titles of God. He does everything that God does. He is our creator, our sustainer, our savior, our preserver, our judge. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And so Christ is great then when you compare him to God. And I must say one thing more, and then I'll close. 
I have now almost presented to you an unattainable, an unreachable Son of God. And that's always been the case that when um, one truth is emphasized and absolutized, that there becomes a reaction. And, and that has been the case uh, in the medieval church where they spoke of the high and holy and great and uplifted and eternal son of God and that's all they spoke about him. And people like you and me said, but, you know, how can I talk to him? How is he interested in this lump I, I've just discovered? My, my son staying out late at, at night. My husband and I not getting on so well. How, how can such a, a mighty and infinite glorious son of God, how can he be interested in us? And so the early church, the medieval church said, ah, well, um, there's Mary. And, um, oh, Mary, is she's very understanding, you know, very compassionate. And you can go to her and you can speak to her and she'll put in a word for you. And we'll give you some beads uh, that you can that can help you to repeat a prayer. Uh, Hail Mary, full of grace and truth. Uh, um, have mercy on us sinners now and in our hour of need. And you repeat it. And, uh, and that's how. And so they created this sort of female goddess. Who could hear millions of people pray at the same time. From Tierra del Fuego to Alaska. From a Chinese uh, rice paddy to Wall Street and they could say that and she would know how to hear and how to answer. And that becomes the danger then of uh, absolutizing one aspect of the Godhead. And so I say one thing more. Jesus is great always also in his compassion. And you can see it at the end of chapter 2 where he talks about um, his tenderness and his uh, compassion for us. Or especially at the end of chapter 4. We have to just go outside the confines of this chapter that was read in your hearing. And at the end of chapter 4 we have that famous statement. We have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but one who was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. The great double negative. Two negatives make a positive. So we can say, we have a high priest who can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Don't feel so well today. and Not a good day today. No, don't get old. Um, feeling weak today. I've got the pains back and dizzy. And, and here is a God so close to us, so merciful, so tender, so understanding. That he doesn't say they're too small for me to bother with. I don't send in a servant girl. I come. I'm there, I'm there with him. He was made in all points as we are. You know, there are no memory cells in the brain of Jesus that have died. At this moment, at the right hand of God, he remembers as vividly as if it were this morning when they whipped him, when he collapsed under the weight of the cross, the pain when they lifted the sledgehammer and nailed his hands and feet to the cross and lifted him up and suspended him there for those hours of dehydration as the sun beat all down upon him. He remembers it all. 
the psalmist says he remembers that we are dust. It's not his omniscience helps him to understand what dust is. He became dust. And he remembers what it's like to be dust of the earth. And that is the stuff of his compassion. And today, at the right hand of God, he is saying, Father, there's that woman in Cape Cod, and she's going through such a difficult time. She's got heartache, tensions in the family with her health. and She's troubled deeply. Father, send the Holy Spirit to her now. Give her strength. Assure her of your love. Confirm the forgiveness of her sins. And the father always hears what the son asks and he sends the spirit now into your life and into my life. Our Jesus, great in compassion. And when we stand in the last day before him and sometimes the thought of it is so frightening that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ the Christ we'll meet at that judgment seat is the one who hung on the cross and said father forgive them they know not what they do the loving saviour the tender He'll bring all the factors into consideration. He'll be scrupulously fair in everything he does, that every mouth will be stopped and we will bow in in worship of this great and wonderful and merciful Saviour. I've told you this morning about the greatness of Jesus Christ, that he is absolutely great. You compare him to prophets or angels or anything in the whole cosmos. You compare him with God and he's great, standing alongside his father. But he's also great in his compassion. He's brought you here at this time in your life when you've not lived as you should live not lived loving him and serving him and doing his will but look he's brought you here again to hear of the deep deep love of Jesus vast unmeasured boundless free and he's offering himself to be your Lord the Lamb of God who will take away your sin and you uh, you must respond now I can't uh, understand How anyone could come and hear of the greatness of my Saviour, Jesus Christ, and say, yes, but could could you do that? To hear of this great Saviour? And then say, yes, but... Every mouth stopped before him. And when he gives us permission to speak, we can just say, I wish it wasn't me. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry that I've always put you off and and put you off. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm so sorry. Will you take me? Will you take me now? A little sinner with nothing to plead but my great need and your great compassion. And you start talking to him. You start talking to him. It doesn't matter what you say. There's no formula to learn and repeat. You just, you just start speaking to Jesus. Tell him about yourself. And tell him about your doubts. and Tell him about your needs. And you just talk to him and you keep talking to him. And you keep talking to him until 
you have an inner assurance that he's heard you, an inner voice, an, an inner testimony, a witness. It says, yes, my child, I love you. Lord, bless your word to us now, we pray, and give us much grace to receive it and believe it and live only and always for you as number one in our lives. Fit us to live better and to die ready to meet you and be with you forever. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.